Former pop star Sinead O'Connor wrote a memoir. You might remember Sinead O'Connor if you're my age or older. She wrote the song that narrated your first breakup, if your parents let you, you know, date in sixth grade. Mine didn't, but if they had, Nothing Compares to You would have been my breakup song. <gasps> it's been seven hours and 15 days. No! Since you took your love away. The saddest song ever! Dad, help! Hang on, son, I'm coming! I go out every night and sleep all day. In the early 90s, Sinead O'Connor was famous for being beautiful, for having a shaved head, and for having an ethereal, lovely voice. But then, one day on SNL, she ripped up the picture of the Pope. That's pretty much to this day all anybody knows about her. Despite that long absence from public life, I was very interested in reading her memoir. You may note that I have a class on writing memoirs now available, shameless plug, in which I tell you to structure your memoir like a novel, that you should not, under any circumstances, make your memoir just a series of rememberings, if you will. Little vignettes about your life. I admonish you against doing these things. And then Sinead went and did just that. Why are you trying to make me look bad, Sinead? Hello, shameless writers. I'm Kristen McTiernan, the Nonsense Free Editor, here for your weekly dose of writing wisdom. This week, I had the borderline pleasure of reading Sinead O'Connor's Rememberings, her recently published memoir. Unlike the great majority of my reading, I actually read her book on my Kindle instead of doing the audiobook because I knew that whatever narrator they chose, even if it was Sinead herself, it would be distracting and I really wanted to get into the nitty gritty of how she constructed her story. I intend to review it today not so much from the perspective of a reader, even though probably most of you do read for fun, I know I do, but really from the perspective of an aspiring memoirist. Because a great deal of what Sinead does with the structure of her story, with the way that she writes her sentences themselves, go against what I advise you to do. And in some ways it works. But in others, it doesn't. I want to be very clear about that. So today I'm going to be giving a review of what I liked about it, what I didn't like about it, and just the overall impressions of the memoir and how I felt coming away from it. A lot of people say or think that tearing up the Pope's photo derailed my career. That's not how I feel about it. I feel that having a number one record derailed my career and my tearing the photo put me back on the right track. There are a lot of parts in this book where I don't believe Sinead. I don't believe what she's saying. But this, I believe her. So let's start out with the style. Instead of the narrative style that I advise where writing a memoir like a novel, Sinead O'Connor does not structure her memoir like a novel. And frankly, if I were the one doing the classifying, I wouldn't even call it a memoir. It's more like a book of short essays. And even that might not be doing it justice because books of essays tend to have some unifying theme where especially in the first part of the book, and it is pretty clearly bifurcated, which she tells you about in the prologue, there really doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason with the order of the chapters. They don't go in chronological order. They don't really go in any order uh, accordance with the theme. Um, it's kind of a mess. Now she does let us know right off the bat in the foreword that there was a four year gap between the scene where she wrote about her night at SNL and everything that came afterward in the book. The reason for that was because she had a health problem and apparently uh, due to the surgery, she had a radical hysterectomy, which means they take your uterus and your ovaries. Um, apparently that can cause extreme complications, particularly people who already have pre-existing mental illness and everything bad that could happen as a result of that surgery did happen to her. And part of that was memory loss. So. She warns us right up front that there are going to be holes in her storytelling and boy oh, she was not kidding. If I'd have been her editor, there would have been a lot of changes that I made and when you're working with someone with a compromised memory, honestly, I feel like her editor should have worked a little bit harder on her book. In reading it, I get the impression that maybe her editor didn't care. I mean, I don't know this person, but 
If she was my client, I would not have let the book out the door um, in this state. Uh, for one, there's a prologue that really isn't necessary. Uh, for two, throughout the first part especially, it varies wildly between whether she's telling it in the past tense or in the present tense, which is odd. Uh, because the narration style that she has throughout the book is of Sinead now looking back. We never have any scenes where Sinead, the young 20-year-old, is talking to you and bringing you along with her life. We don't hear from Sinead, the 7-year-old, dealing with the abusive mother. We don't deal with any of that. We deal with 50-something Sinead looking back and telling you, her reader, her friend, because she does speak to you in a very friendly way what happened to her when she was young, and how she feels about it now. We can hear the wisdom in her words, and this is a specific style, and it's not one that, would, that I would have protested against. However, it does take something away from the verisimilitude, because you never really feel like you're right there with her as it's happening. Instead, you feel like she's either telling you a story as the two of you share a drink in a bar, or you're like the ghost of Christmas past, and you're just kind of standing on the edge of things as she explains things to you. Another thing about the style, particularly in the first half before she had her medical issues where she had some memory loss, um, we tended to jump very wildly. For instance, she uh, got married at a young age when she became pregnant with her first child, you know, being Irish Catholic and, you know, that's just what you do if you get pregnant, you get married, even though she stated later in the book, not at the time, but later, that she thought of her child's father more as a good friend, and to this day she's still very close with him, and apparently they love each other, just not that way. But there are parts where we have a chapter where she's marrying John, she's having her first child, she's very happy, she had to walk away from her first record deal because they basically tried to pressure her into getting an abortion because it wasn't convenient for their record deal that they had struck. But then in the very next chapter, she's going from bus to bus nailing roadies, and there's no mention of John. There's no mention of her child. And it's not really clear what year this is taking place. It's not clear if she and John are already divorced or if they've just made an arrangement in the interim while they're getting a divorce. We don't know what caused the divorce, whose decision it was. We know none of these things. We just know John was there. He was very kind. They got married, and then they weren't married anymore. It's a very strong contrast with the way that another Irish celebrity, Maureen O'Hara, wrote her memoir. And I read that when I was in college, I think, and I just devoured it. Why? Because she wrote her memoir in the style that I advocate. The whole time you felt that you were with Maureen O'Hara. And when she was mistreated by directors, by other actors, by men in her life, you felt that rage with her. And when she told you, I'm Maureen O'Hara and I have a bad temper and I'm not sorry, you saw that and you experienced it with her. Sinead tells us that she has a bad temper and that she's made mistakes. But we never feel the anger. I suspect that's because she, as a very religious woman, doesn't want to dwell on that, and I can respect that. But it does leave you feeling a little distant from the goings-on in the book. I mentioned earlier that there were parts where I felt like Sinead was lying through omission, and there were a lot of those. Now, I don't want to be overly cruel because, as stated, because of her medical condition, she does have severe gaps in her memory. She's also indicated that she abused marijuana to the point of borderline addiction, um, as well as doing other drugs. She wrote a whole chapter about her drug use, but, um, you know, everybody has their things. I, I can't do drugs. I don't read about people who do drugs. I can't watch movies about drug people like Requiem for a Dream will never be a movie I watch. I don't care how many of my college buddies tell me, oh my gosh, it's so great. I don't believe you and I don't care. I have, it's a problem. So I skipped that chapter. Um, but she does seem to be aware of the lies that I noticed that she's leaving out. But I kind of understand why she did it. For instance, she goes to great lengths to be apologetic towards her father. Um, this was a house of abuse, the O'Connor house. And whereas the stereotype is, you know, if there's abuse in the house, it's always the father. In this case, it wasn't. Um, Sinead O'Connor was viciously abused by her mother. She was a nasty piece of work. And even with the very light touch that she takes on the types of abuse that she experienced, we get the impression that it was very bad. And she also talks about the very real strain that exists to this day between herself and her siblings. You know, she mentioned that children of abuse 
they love each other, but it's difficult for them to be close because they are reminded of the abuse that they suffered when they spend time together. Um, I'm lucky enough that I've never experienced any such thing, but I imagine that's true. However, it does seem that her relationship with her father is something that now, by all accounts, is good. She loves her father. She feels guilty for ha him having to go through the difficult times with her as a young woman. And we can presume as a grown adult because she did have <laughs> a lot of problems as a grown adult. But she never talks about the problems that she had with her father, but she does talk about her almost obsessive need for male pop stars, male celebrities to step in and be that father figure for her. For instance, she was inconsolable after the death of Elvis because she felt that she loved him and that she wanted him to come and take care of her because his music soothed her. And after he died, she moved on to Bob Dylan because his music really spoke to her soul. It wasn't just that she loved their lyrics, it was that she loved them. She saw them as paternal characters who would care for her. Uh, later on in the book, she discusses not a musician, but Muhammad Ali and how she saw in him as he preened for the camera and said, I'm the greatest, I'm beautiful. And with her being so beaten down, not just by her abusive household, but by the general very Catholic Irish environment that says you can't compliment yourself. The more ashamed of yourself you are, the more pious you are. And so that was the culture. And so she got to meet Muhammad Ali, and this is as an adult, okay? She is a grown woman. And still, she just feels that overwhelming paternal love for him. And you have to wonder where that's coming from. Um, I'm blessed, my father is still in my life, he's a good father, and I don't have those issues where, you know, you started dating early and you, you basically, what do they call it? Never lay down for the father, but she did over and over and over again. And you had to wonder because there was something going on with her relationship with her father as a young woman. Because if you're being abused by one parent, logic dictates because you're a child, you're blaming the other one. Why aren't you protecting me? And she spent her whole life looking for someone to protect her. And she said it in the line, I was just looking for someone to be kind to me. And while we can understand that she loves her father and she understands that, that he was probably being abused too, because generally the abusive spouse isn't just abusive to the children, often it drifts into the spouse in other ways. But there was just a very notable gap in her relationship with her father as a child and even now. It's just that he was a good man, she loved him, and that's really all we got. She even excuses the fact that her father and her stepmother, by this time her parents had divorced because her mother was an abusive, awful person, sent her to a reform school. And she didn't come out and say this, but it sounds like she was sent to a Magdalene Sisters type of Irish laundry. For those of you who have not seen the Magdalene Sisters, um, in Ireland, as late as the 1970s, you could take your unwanted daughter or wife, even if they were an adult, and just drop them off at these church-run organizations, and they would keep them there imprisoned forever, making them do hard labor and abusing them, um, unless a male relative came to claim them. So yeah, she was dropped off at one of those places as a misbehaving young girl. Now, when she came of age, she did get to leave, her brother came and got her. So that was nice of him. It's just a recounting of the injustices that occurred not only in the, not only in the school, but in Ireland in general, how one of her fellow uh, inmates, I guess we can call them, uh, you know, got out on a day pass and she got pregnant and she had the baby and she loved him. And they just took her baby because she was unmarried. She didn't need to sign anything. She didn't want them to take her baby. They just took it because that was how they rolled. Oh, you're unmarried? Okay, well, we're stealing your baby. And that was something that they did. And Sinead O'Connor just recounts that. And she talks about how lovely the girl is and how beautiful she was and what a kind soul that she had and how sad she was that she missed the baby. But there's just... <sighs> you know when your mom like softens a story because she doesn't want to hurt you, so she just tells it in a very kind of high-level way. It's like, well, you know, it, this happened, but this was the times. I got that vibe, and I don't like that in my memoirs. And I have to be kind of mad at the editor here, because honestly, when you're dealing with a famous author, 
A lot of times they don't know what order to put their memories in, but the editor should. So I'm wondering if there was something going on at the publishing house where maybe she refused to publish it if they edited it at all. That seems unlikely. I don't think traditional publishers work that way. So I don't know what was going on behind the scenes, but it seems like the editor took an overly light touch here because there was there were a lot better ways to make this book with this really pop and tie in the themes. The second part of the book is structured a little more strongly. This is after she had her hysterectomy surgery. This is after she lost a lot of her memory. Um, and there was a four year gap and it focused almost entirely on her music, which, you know, I'm, I'm not a music lover, particularly the technical aspects of music. Um, I'm not a musician oriented person. And so these chapters weren't really as interesting for me, but I can see where they would be to a lot of other people. Um, however, they were a lot more logically ordered and she seems to have come through that medical experience just maybe a little less frenetic. However, even in this new style where it's more logically ordered, there's still that sense of obfuscation where she'll throw out a line and you feel like there's a whole story behind it and you're not really sure what it refers to. For instance, in referring to her album Theology, she says, I love performing these songs live. And as I said, if I go out in a coffin, it's the only record that I'm bringing with me to heaven in the hope that it will make up for what a complete piece of shit I am the rest of the time. Why are you a complete piece of shit? Because I got to tell you, miss, I sit with dying veterans and I love my children and I love my family and I don't talk about their peccadilloes in my memoirs. Um, I'm not getting the impression that you're a complete piece of shit. Quite the opposite. Uh, is there something you'd like to share to bolster this? I feel like maybe that should be in the book. However, all those flaws aside, again, I don't want to make it seem like I didn't like the book. It probably sounds like I didn't, but it's just <laughs> as the, as an editor, I would, I would have made this better. I know that's really, there's an editor in New York right now going, excuse me, like, okay. There are a lot of opportunities to tie together some loose threads and just make it a more cohesive story, even with the vignette style. For instance, Sinead does a wonderful job of detailing the effects of her mother's abuse. And it went with her through her whole life. So for instance, I know I didn't know this and I can't imagine any of you know it either, but the picture of the Pope that she ripped up on SNL, guess where she got that picture? She did not print that off the internet because it was 1992. You know where she got it? It was her mom's. Her mother, who beat the hell out of her kids, would go out in the street and pretend to be a pious, good Catholic woman and a good wife. And she kept a big picture of Pope John Paul II right there on her living room wall so everyone could see what a good Catholic she was. Yeah, I'm sure that rubbed Sinead all kinds of the wrong way. Now, of course, by this time her mother had passed and she did talk about how even though what a horrible woman she was, she still had a very difficult time when her mother died, but she kept that picture. And I guess it never really sat right with her soul. And so she took her mother's picture, her mother's false piety, and she ripped that up on SNL. So yeah, of course it was about the abuse in the Catholic church that yes, Pope John Paul II knew about and covered up. And she told people and they all called her liar Frank Sinatra actually threatened to physically beat her as they were staying in the same hotel. I also like the story that she told where as a, as a previous aspiring nun, I like to hear stories where nuns are kind uh, to the people in their charge. And it turns out that a nun at the reform school is the one who bought Sinead her first guitar. It was a birthday gift and she loved the way she sang and she saw that she had a love of music and so she bought her a guitar. So I really love to hear that. What shines through throughout this book more than anything is how much Sinead loves music and how much she loves God. Even from a very young age, this was a very spiritual little girl. Now, of course, in Ireland, she was raised Catholic. That was the only religion that she knew. But as she grew older, she kept searching for God and searching for God. And she looked all over for him, looking for what seemed right to her. I think I, she didn't mention it in the book, but I seem to recall at some point she became an ordained minister of a Protestant faith. I remember her wearing a reverence collar. 
um, still bald at the time, um, and this was before her medical emergency. And now, of course, she has famously converted to Islam, and by all accounts in the book, she seems to genuinely be at peace and feels that this is the ultimate expression of love and obedience to God, and, and I believe her. In addition to talking about her love of music, she also talks about her absolute hatred and disgust of the pop industry. And, you know, as we've seen everything that's going on in Hollywood now and all of the horrible stories that have come out, and we can infer that pretty much every single female celebrity who we have ever admired has had to degrade herself to get where she is now. And it is horrific to think about. And it's also shining a light on how maybe she wasn't crazy after all to not want to be a part of that because she was here for the music. She wasn't here to be prostituted, basically. And she does tell a funny story where one of her first managers was a part-time pimp. That was his side gig, I guess. He had a, a house of ill repute that he ran in the evenings in addition to managing singers. And he said it plainly. He said the music industry and the horn business are exactly the same business. Exactly. Which makes me really sad for every female singer and actress I've ever admired. This is brought to a head, especially with the scene that she wrote about meeting Prince. And it was just, it was so bizarre and so real. I mean, everything that we've heard about Hollywood and the types of behavior that is just accepted as normal there. For instance, in the book, uh, Prince just calls up Sinead. She doesn't know him. They don't have any mutual friends. He calls her at her house. Why does he have her phone number? And says, hey, I'm sending a, are you Sinead? I'm going to send a car for you. Come hang out with me. Oh, sure, man, I don't know. Let me get in this car with this other man I don't know where he can drive me to a location that I've never been before and don't know the address. And then I can walk into a dark house that is being inhabited by a man I don't know. And then, of course, when she gets there, he is abominable to her. No, he didn't assault her or anything like that, but he just behaved oddly and very intimidating. And the scene made no sense. And I, as I was reading it, I was like, did this even happen? But then as we got to the end, oh, yes, it did. He was in a dispute with her manager or her record company. Who was it? I think, I think he had a dispute with like her record company. So he basically planned this whole thing to just strike a blow against some other man that he had a beef with. And it's entirely believable and awful to the point where she basically had to flee his property and walk on foot and pound on doors. Nobody would open it because there's some crazy lady knocking on your door. I wouldn't open either. And then finally she got to a payphone. remember those? And she had to call a friend to come and pick her up. That is horrible. I think she was 21 at the time and yeah, and that now that with what we know out of coming out of Hollywood, that's just pretty par for the course. And again, she tells this with no anger, <laughs> none. It's like she's telling a funny story. It's not funny, Sinead. It's not funny. <laughs> Holy shit. So my final verdict of the book is that while Muddled Rememberings does have some positive points, it was definitely worth the reading. Um, it was far too long. There are scenes that should have been slashed. There are definitely scenes that should have been reordered. And considering her memory problems, honestly, her publisher should have hired an investigator, should have spoken to people, and should have filled in at least some of the gaps. I understand we want to respect people's privacy, but some of those gaps should have been filled in for the book, at least with the details that Portia Nade herself can't remember due to her illness. In looking at her book, I don't have a clear idea of what her theme is. I tell everybody who writes a memoir, you know, you need to know what your theme is. What are you writing about? Because this isn't your total life. And if I had to guess from reading both parts of her book, I think the theme is the beauty of music and the fact that it is a vessel for God to speak to people, or at least for her it is. Um, and I can't really argue with that theme. You really have to dig to find it, especially with the order of the scenes. A lot of it comes at the end. Um, but the way she speaks about music is really quite beautiful. And, and I think with some restructuring and some work, I think this could have been a, a really wonderful ode to music itself and a reflection on why the greater music industry, especially the pop industry, 
is actually bad for music. And, I, and honestly, in looking at all of the things that she put in this book and all of the gaps that were left out, I really strongly believe that an impartial biographer could really make a meal out of her life. And honestly, I hope one does. I hope before I'm done here, we get a full biography of one Miss Sinead O'Connor. Because I think her life is one worth reading about in its totality. So that's all for this week. Take care and write well.